Hello and welcome to Conversations. My name is David and I serve as the Director of Online Learning for Our Daily Bread Ministries and we're delighted to have JR with us today as well as uh, our listeners. Uh, we're looking at a new resource from Our Daily Bread, uh, the Discovery Series called In Pursuit of Jesus. And um, uh, we're going to focus on this particular resource as it looks at how people view Jesus today uh, compared to what the Bible uh, says about him. Uh, as I said, we have JR with us. He is the executive editor of Our Daily Bread Discovery Series uh, and the author of today's resource. So it's, uh, it's good to have you with us today, JR. Thanks, David. It's good to be here. JR, can you tell us a little bit about the Discovery Series, um, what it offers, where we find it, and things of that nature? Uh, yeah, Discovery Series is, uh, as you mentioned, it's part of the family of resources that Our Daily Bread Ministries offers. And kind of in a nutshell, what we do is we, we try to tackle issues of biblical studies and theology in really short, accessible formats, um, you know, 6,000 words or so in, uh, in an online read or in a, in a printed booklet, taking issues of how do I read the Bible better? Or what does it mean that one of God's characteristics is aseity? Um, even, even to stretching to things of practical Christian living, like how do I deal with my anger, my, my, my depression, or how can I know how to pray better or make decisions that I think God wants me to make? Um, we really try to help people both understand God better through learning how to read scripture better, but also how to live the Christian life, how to spread God's kingdom and be a citizen of his kingdom while we find ourselves in the different situations that we face. Okay. And where can we find these? Uh, discoveryseries.org is our is our website and there you can order a, a, a printed booklet and it'll come to you in the mail you can actually sign up to join our mailing list which will send you the brand new booklet every month uh, in the mail and, and you can read it that way or you can download a PDF you can listen to certain certain titles through our audio feature and we also have uh, an online read you can read it directly on the website okay that's that's great information there for especially the audio I didn't know you had audio so um... yeah. And you can download. We don't have all of our titles in audio yet. We're working on that. And going forward, we'll have uh, more titles in audio. But we do have a few audio titles. And they're there either as a streaming listen or download. I've read uh, several of the DS booklets. They're easy to put into a Bible, carry with you, especially if it's mm -hmm. biblical studies. It's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, we are uh, today talking with JR about the resource that he wrote uh, on Jesus, or at least pursuing Jesus. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of why you wrote this particular resource? Yeah, well, as a, as a ministry, we did a campaign called In Pursuit of Jesus, and part of the campaign was to create a resource that looked at some of the stories of the Bible and how people reacted to Jesus, some of the responses that they had in, in his own time. And, you know, as we were looking at those stories, what, what I wanted to do wasn't to pull out the bullet points of the story and say, this person was confused and this person was this, but to really try to retell the story in such a way that the reader was experiencing it along with the person, along with the characters of the story. Um, mm -hmm. So to try to understand why someone would have responded that way to Jesus. And honestly, David, I think the categories that I, that are, that are identified in the categories that I wrote about, I think we can still respond to Jesus in those exact same ways, whether we're, whether we've been a follower of his for a long time or whether we don't follow him at all. Um, you know, they, there's the possibility that in different situations, we respond to Jesus differently, even while holding a core belief about him. Um, you know, I, you and I are, are followers of Jesus, and, and yet in different circumstances, we may have different questions about what's happening in our lives and about how does this fit with what I thought I knew of Jesus. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to write a resource that helped people uh, kind of experience those stories in a little bit different format than what they're presented as in scripture. And I, I, to be honest, I use a little bit of, you know, kind of holy imagination as a writer to envision what might be going through the characters' minds and kind of through their emotions as they encountered Jesus or as they talked about Jesus and thought about Jesus, um, you know, to give those characters a little bit more relational mm -hmm. experience with us as we think about them and as we think about our own responses to Jesus. I've, I've noticed when I was pastoring a couple of years ago, there was, uh, when I would encounter people, it depended on the season of their life, uh, had a lot to do mm. with how they would encounter their, or at least their relationship with God would change over the seasons. I mean, people that had young kids, people had kids outside of the house, 
seasons even just of sickness, uh, going through trouble, pain, uh, loss of a business or a loved one. So yeah, I, I, I definitely can empathize with that idea of people as in their seasons of life, they're going to respond to him differently. And um, so as we look over the world, I mean, there are major, I'm sure there's, there's different major perspectives on Jesus. So as we, as we kind of land in here into the book that you've written and look at some of the content here, what are some of those major perspectives that, G, uh, uh, that people have of Jesus uh, kind of globally today? Uh, where, where do we find ourselves? Sure. I, you know, and it's, it's funny, you know, I don't think uh, probably along with the writer of Ecclesiastes, you know, there's kind of nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think we find ourselves in a terribly different position globally now than when Jesus was walking the earth. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a wide variety and, you know, they, they fall into very different nuanced categories, but kind of broadly speaking, there's, there's probably at least three. Um, you know, the one that I would say is, you know, a, a high opinion of Jesus as a as a good teacher, a good man. He he espoused a high moral ethic, you know, of, of how we treat each other, how we treat ourselves. And, um, you know, he was a good teacher, but probably one among many throughout history, you know, kind of on par with Buddha or Confucius or, or someone like that who really helped people live well. Um, you know, and another perspective is or I mean, maybe it's better stated as a, a lack of perspective, to be honest. Um, maybe it's simply that, you know, Jesus is Jesus and, you know, he's got a lot of followers and I, you know, I'm not sure what he has to do with me. So kind of just an, an, an ignoring um, at, at best, or, you know, part of that category might be that, you know, they thought Jesus was just a normal guy who got some followers really ramped up about what he said, and then everything got blown out of proportion. So thinking that, that Jesus wasn't anything special and that he doesn't have anything to do with uh, life then or life now. And then maybe the third major category is where you and I find ourselves, um, you know, understanding and believing that Jesus, the, the man who walked the earth, uh, you know, a couple thousand years ago, was actually the incarnate son of God. He was God himself with skin on and that he came and was born and experienced life as a human in order to restore the relationship that humanity lost um, with God. And, you know, that's, so we consider ourselves followers of Jesus, not simply his teaching, but we believe that he in his life, death and resurrection did something for humanity that we can't do for ourselves in restoring our standing with God and taking, you know, not to get too theological about it, but taking the, you know, taking the penalty and the consequences of our sin on himself so that we did not have to bear those. Yeah. It's almost like doubt, acknowledgement, and acceptance. You have to doubt where yeah. I don't believe it. Acknowledgement. Yeah, he was there, but it has nothing to do with me to acceptance. Um, acceptance yeah. So, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's a good, good summary there of, of kind of how people are, are viewing and, and responding to him. But it is the most important question we can ask uh, and answer in our lives is to, who was Jesus and what did he do? So much rest. Yeah, I, I think so. So you begin the book with the question, who am I? Uh, and the question really is relating to Jesus. And it comes from Matthew mm -hmm. chapter 16. Let me just read these two verses, verses 13 and 14 uh, that you quote here. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And this is a reference to himself. And they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, why is this question, uh, the question that Jesus asks here is, who do people say that I am? Why is that an important question? Kind of goes on the heels of what we were just talking about, but kind of dry, bring us a little bit deeper into that. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's, it's an important question because as it relates to Jesus, it's kind of the most basic question uh, that you can ask. You know, how anyone responds to him depends on pretty much entirely who we think he is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, this was true of people in Jesus' day. They, you know, if they thought he was John the Baptist, if they thought he was Elijah, they were going to respond to him differently. Um, and, you know, his import to them or the, the significance of him in their own lives would have varied based on those responses. And I think it's true today. Um, you know, if, if we look at Jesus and we say, well, this is who I think he is, therefore this is the significance that he has for my life. So answering that question, you know, kind of shapes everything that follows in relationship to Jesus. It's, it's the most fundamental from a Christian perspective as a follower of Christ. It's the one that we hope everyone asks and wrestles with. Yeah. Um, 
you know, for us, there's no more important question to not only deal with in a very basic and fundamental one time sense, but to wrestle with every day and say, you know, who is Jesus right now? And, and am I living by what I claim to know or think about him? So, you know, it's the most basic question about Jesus. And it's perhaps the most important question as well is who do we say he is? Who do people say he is? Mm-hmm. And when they, there's a, there's a variety of responses uh, in that story even. And I, I you know, I, I wonder sometimes if, if that's not just representative of how people respond. There are you know, different answers given and it's indicative that, yeah, you know, people do respond to Jesus differently and they have different opinions of who he is. So the story there in scripture, like I said, reflects kind of our situation today where people believe different things about Jesus because of who they think he is mm-hmm. at a very basic level. You, your, your statement there about how people respond, the rest of the book, you really kind of talk about some of those ways mm-hmm. in which Jesus responds. We're only going to take a few of them here for sake of time, but uh, one of them that you, you talk about is the confused. Uh, people mm-hmm. respond to Jesus from a confusion. And I mean, to illustrate uh, this event, you illustrate it with the life of John the Baptist. Now, in John uh, the Apostle, uh, he wrote the Gospel of John. That's different from John the Baptist. He, he talks about John the Baptist being a forerunner of Jesus. Uh, and I believe they were kind of, they were first cousins, if I'm not mistaken here. Mm-hmm. He prepared the way for the Messiah. He uh, taught in the desert. Uh, he preached a baptism of repentance. He had kind of a strange fashion style, had an odd diet. Most people wouldn't want to follow. Uh, but upon baptizing Jesus, um, he acknowledged to his followers that when he looks at me, he says, behold, there is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And that mm-hmm. seems like he's standing on some pretty sure uh, belief there. Some, some sure, sure founding of saying, I know who Jesus is. He sees the spirit coming down. He's baptized and he knows who he is. How, tell us a little bit about how John's response to Jesus can be characterized as confusion. Sure. I, and you're, you're absolutely right, David. Um, you know, there are scenes from John the Baptist's life where, you know, he seems to have uh, extraordinary insight into who Jesus is and, and what he's come to do. You know, his statement about being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world echoes uh, something that the angel had said about Jesus to Mary, um, you know, when he was announcing Jesus' birth, saying, you know, he will, he will save his people from their sins. And you think, oh, I'm, I, I'm sorry, that, that's to Joseph, uh, when he was talking to Joseph. He said, oh, he, this, call him Jesus, he'll save his people from their sins. And, you know, so John is echoing what the angelic messenger said about Jesus beforehand. And yet another instance in John's life, a little later on after the baptism, John finds himself in prison for, you know, uh, he's almost a political dissident, if you, you want to categorize it that way. He was kind of giving uh, the local ruler a bit of a a bit of a morality lesson about taking his brother's wife and and so and John had had uh, called him on the carpet for that for mm-hmm. for his um, immorality and because of that he found himself in prison and you know it's at that point where Jesus where John asks his disciples to go to Jesus and ask him this question he says ask him are you the one or should we expect another now, without getting into too much of, you know, the Jewish, Jewish expectations of Messiah, which are, you know, broad and deep and, uh, uh, you know, very rich, the core of that question, you know, in, in light of his earlier statements, seems to indicate that, at the very least, he's not sure how or why things are unfolding the way they are if Jesus truly is the Messiah. Hmm. Now, part of what, you know, an expectation was, and we see this in in Jesus' followers later on, is that the Messiah was going to bring an earthly kingdom and restore the kingdom and and sovereignty and political power to Israel itself. And my my guess and what I tease in the booklet is that for John, the forerunner of the Messiah, to find himself in prison when Jesus, the Messiah, who was bringing a an earthly kingdom those two things didn't fit really easily together why if jesus was the messiah and was going to bring a political and and you know and and military perhaps kingdom would the forerunner of the messiah find himself in a gentile prison Hmm. and so i think it's that tension of the expectation that john may have had with the reality of his own situation that brings out this question at the very least that he says i can you help me understand what's going on here? Are you the one? Because internally, some of this isn't making any sense. Yeah. 
and David, I think I think that's where a lot of us can even situationally find ourselves. Um, we we find ourselves with certain beliefs about Jesus, certain beliefs about what it means to follow Jesus, and the things that may or may not happen when we become followers of Jesus. And yet, when life doesn't go the way we anticipate or expect, mm. we have to step back and we sometimes wonder do I think about Jesus in the right way? Am I thinking, you know, what has gone wrong here that I thought was going to happen, but now it isn't happening, or I didn't think this was going to happen anymore. And I find myself in a situation like John, where, you know, we're in prison to a Gentile ruler when we're expecting the sovereignty of our own people to be restored. Yeah, it's, it, God doesn't always follow our timetables or our <laughs> paths. We say, I know exactly how my life should go. As you were talking about that, I was thinking about Joseph. I mean, here's Joseph, who was a favorite of the father, and all of a sudden he ends up being persecuted by his sure. brothers. He gets thrown in, and now he's in, he's in slavery, and then he goes even worse into prison, but eventually becomes second leader uh, of the, the nation of, of, um, of Egypt, and he saves the entire Israel, uh, Israel nation, uh, all his right. brothers who would become uh, Israel. He saves them because of that, so it's, a, it's amazing, and you find stories about this. I, I've read stories mm -hmm. of of um, uh, missionaries who things didn't quite go the way they want, but somehow God had always orchestrated and it brings it right exactly to where they are. And, and that idea of doubt, uh, I think most of us can, can at least agree, even if you, I don't know how many degrees you have or what kind of positions you've served in the church, doubt is something that can get to you, you know, and you do, mm -hmm. you start wondering. I mean, so I think that's a point of, 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 com of residence there with, with who John the Baptist was. I think so. And, you know, and, and doubt is, is magnified um, by expectation. You know, mm -hmm. we, and, and it's nearly impossible to live without expectation. You know, you mentioned Joseph and, you know, the case of another dream uh, that predicted something, yet the how and the when of Joseph's dream certainly weren't what he envisioned, you know, when he had <laughs> the dream, you know, yeah. but, like, oh, this is my path to, to being, uh, you know, for that dream to be fulfilled. And, you know, I, I can't imagine, and even if he did know, I, I can imagine that maybe Joseph might have said, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting that mom and dad and my brothers might bow down to me, but I don't want to go through all of that. So let's, let's just skip some of that. Um, but, you know, it, it's our expectations that can make those doubts even more difficult to deal with when situations don't go the way we think they are, uh, the way they think we think they should. Um, and so, but yet it's impossible not to have expectations. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we expect life to go a certain way and are disappointed. We're, we're either overly disappointed when it doesn't go that way, or conversely, you know, sometimes our expectation can make the joy that much sweeter when something good does happen. When our expectations are fulfilled, we think, you know, it, it makes it a mountaintop experience instead of simply a, you know, so expectation can be a double-edged sword. And I think here for, for John the Baptist, it, it cut deeply into his, confidence and his idea of what Messiah was going to do. That's true. And I, I think I hear people talk about, I want to know what the future holds. And I think, you know, I'm not sure if I really want to know. Because I mean, if, if Joseph or even John the Baptist knew, hey, I'm going to die in a prison being beheaded, that mm. could weigh heavily on a person, you know, knowing that it's only eight months away or six months. I mean, sure. how effective would we be if we really knew what was going to happen in the future? And I think that's one of the reasons we, we just don't know that. Um, no one no. knows that, even though some claim that they do. But uh, it's, it's good that Fair we enough. don't. It's good that we don't. So another yeah. response that uh, people give to Jesus is what you call the skeptical response. Mm. And uh, here you draw from the story of Jesus's visit to his hometown in Mark chapter six, where the people who grew up with Jesus really just rejected him and all of his teaching. Uh, so mm. why do you think the people at that time? I mean, here are the people that are around him, his contemporaries, the religious leaders. Why were they skeptical of Jesus uh, at that time? And, and viewed him in that particular way? You know, I, I've often wanted to say, I'm going to tell a little bit of a story here. Um, I, in my, my first college experience, I, I went to a small Bible college out in Montana. And to be perfectly frank, I didn't really want to go. Uh, I, was a, I was a bit of a Debbie Downer for quite some time in my first weeks there. And I, my first encounter with one of the staff members there, um, I apparently, and I, I say apparently because I get reminded of this quite often, uh, I apparently said, <laughs> when she asked, how are you? 
I said, I don't want to be here. And, you know, I, I, just, I was 19. I had my own, <laughs> I was 19. I had my own reasons for not wanting to be there. Um, but the, what's funny is now this is, uh, we're now 22 years on the other side of that experience. But every time I connect with that particular person, that story gets told. <laughs> So um, my life for that person isn't a movie that continues to go. It's a snapshot. And I just held right there in that moment in time for that person. And, uh, you know, I, in the booklet, I call it pigeonholing. Um, and I think that's what happened with Jesus and his hometown friends, his hometown people. Um, they pigeonholed him as though they knew everything there was to know about him. Uh, you know, the scripture story is, is actually pretty explicit in that, you know, Jesus had built a reputation for himself before he returned to his hometown for teaching and miracles and all of these things. And yet when he returned to his hometown, they didn't want to listen to him. They, he, he couldn't perform any miracles. Um, and Jesus himself was shocked by their unbelief. And, you know, I, I think it comes from the statements that are recorded in scripture. They say, you know, isn't this Mary and Joseph's son? Isn't this, you know, aren't his brothers and sisters here with us? Isn't he the carpenter? Yeah. And I, I pull on that a little bit and say, you know, they, they weren't asking past tense. When he was here with us, wasn't he a carpenter? When he comes back, even with his reputation for teach, wise teaching and miracles, they still say he is the carpenter. They, and they ask a very present question. Um, and I think that's indicative that they kind of thought much the way that, you know, my, <laughs> the former staff at that, that school thought, is this is who we this is who we know you are and you can never be anything different than this as far as we're concerned and so they pigeonhole him and they you know it, it says that jesus couldn't do any miracles in his hometown except for to to heal a few people and it's not that his power was limited uh, by their unbelief it's that i you know it doesn't say it, it simply scripture simply says that he couldn't perform many miracles but i you know, it's not as though his power is generated by belief, um, you know, that like many Santa Claus movies, the, the belief in Santa Claus is what gives him his magical powers. No, on the contrary, I think what happened was Jesus went there and because they knew who he was, they thought they knew who he was, nobody brought the sick to be healed. Hmm. They didn't think that he, you know, so when it says he couldn't heal any, it's not because he didn't have the power. It was because they didn't give him the opportunity. Yeah. They didn't get to experience all of who Jesus was because they thought they knew who he was. Yeah. That's an interesting way of, of seeing that. I've never actually seen it that way. That's very interesting. Um, um, I, again, a, a little bit of, uh, of holy imagination there, but you know, it's, not a, it's not too much of a stretch, I don't think, to, to see people saying, yeah, you know, thanks, Carpenter, but this is a fever that the doctor needs to take care of. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, um, it makes sense. I mean, it definitely makes sense. I've often wondered if there was any playing kind of in the background of that, was there any jealousy that people had, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I've wondered that even with his, because you, you have like James, his one of his brothers, half brothers, becomes the pastor, many believe, of the church in Jerusalem. Jude mm -hmm. also writes a book. I mean, so I thought, how hard would it have been to have Jesus as the older brother? You know, it really is. Why don't you be more like Jesus? I mean, because right. perfect. But, you know, you think, I mean, his brothers back in, I think it was in John chapter six or seven, when Jesus is going to go up, they actually kind of taunt him. Why don't you go mm, up to Jerusalem yeah. if you're all that? I mean, show all right. these miracles, supposedly. Uh, so they didn't believe him to begin with. And I wonder, was there some that was you know, some sense of jealousy? Like, that's just Jesus, the carpenter, you know, I'm just as good as he is. And he claims to be the Messiah or, or such. So you, I've often thought about that idea of it, jealousy, how that play in. I don't, uh, I don't think that's an impossible, uh, you know, an impossible thing at all. And, and I, I talk about it a little bit in the book that I'm saying some of the reasons that we pigeonhole people are because we might in fact be jealous that mm. something has happened to them that we wish would have happened to us. And, mm. you know, as, as you're talking about you know, being more like Jesus, I uh, wondered, you know, how would his brothers and, and sisters reacted if they would have known about the, you know, and it's been a while ago now, but the, the fad of jewelry and t-shirts and everything that said, what would Jesus do? Like, I can imagine them going, oh, here we go again. The you know, I'm sure. And it, it is, it, it would be, you know, I mean, I, I don't imagine that Jesus made it hard for his brothers and sisters. No. Uh, but, but at the same time, 
you know, there, there had to be some, some instances, all of the things that Mary and Joseph knew about Jesus from their angelic visits when, when Mary was pregnant and uh, the different things that were said about Jesus as a baby, all of the things they knew, you know, raising that child would have been extraordinarily difficult. And how do you, you know, how do you raise other children who aren't that same way, who aren't, yeah, you know, the perfect. incarnate son of God? No. Yeah, that, that could be um, difficult. Yeah. And, you know, David, it's, it's funny. I think, um, so, you know, these are, these people, you know, Jesus hometown people, friends and, and family obviously weren't followers of his. Um, but one of the things that I think is really interesting and, and, and perhaps needs to be wrestled with for followers of Jesus is that we can do the same thing to Jesus from time to time. Um, we can pigeonhole him as well, thinking that we know exactly how Jesus wants us to behave or exactly how we should behave in a given situation because that's in line with what Jesus does. And, and I, I wouldn't dispute that on probably 90% of the circumstances that we think of, but I, but I wonder sometimes if our certainty about how Jesus wants us to behave, how uh, the things that he wants us to say, the people that he wants us to engage with. I, I wonder about whether or not our certainty of that isn't sometimes misplaced. And I think of all of the stories in, in the Gospels when Jesus did something that was wholly unexpected for a good Jewish person, you know, especially for someone who is coming as God's, as Messiah, the anointed one to represent God on earth and to, you know, pull people back into relationship with him. You know, and I, the, the people that he contacted made literal physical contact with, not to say nothing of the people that he spoke with and brought into the kingdom of God. Mm. Those were people, you know, he, he made people upset who thought they knew what Messiah was supposed to do. True. And they had him pigeonholed. This is not, this is not how Messiah would act. Why are you doing this? And I, I think it's possible that sometimes we're a little bit too confident in our ability to assess exactly what Jesus would do or exactly what Jesus wants us to do. And there, there may be times where we miss an opportunity because we're confident that Jesus doesn't want us to go there or doesn't want us to, you know, talk to this person, you know, or to be friends with this person, let alone, you know, um, share a meal with them or, or something like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm often reminded of, you know, the Pharisees and Sadducees in John chapter five. Uh, it's a terrifying verse, to be perfectly honest. As a, as a, as a Bible student or even as a Christ follower, he's, you know, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, um, "You study the scriptures diligently, thinking that in them you have eternal life, but these are the same scriptures that point to me, and yet they missed it." And so there's this idea of the, the question comes out of, "Well, how did they miss him?" Well, it's because they thought they knew what scripture was saying and they weren't open to being challenged on those things. And so this idea of pigeonholing scripture, what scripture says, pigeonholing Jesus can come back to haunt us in some really hard ways because we might miss him either when he's standing right in front of us or when he, you know, in life, when the spirit presents us with an opportunity to do something and we think, no, Jesus wouldn't want me to do that. Yeah. And so we move beyond and, and miss Jesus where he is. I know when you read the New Testament, you see that many of them were looking for that relig that not a religious uh, savior necessarily, but a political mm -hmm. deliverer. You know, I mean, we're mm -hmm. impressed by Rome. We're we're waiting for this person to come and open. I mean, even the the disciples. Whenever you come after the the resurrection in Acts chapter one, is this the time that you're going to restore <laughs> the kingdom? It must be now. I mean, you've we we finally figured all this stuff out, and you've done everything. So we're looking for that deliverer. And he says, it's not for you to know those times. So, I mean, they definitely right. were thinking that Jesus was going to do one thing and he just keeps them guessing. So, but there were a lot of people that missed it, uh, just yeah. completely missed who, who he was. So the third way you say people kind of respond to Jesus is antagonistically. Um, mm -hmm. Now during Jesus's day, those who were antagonistic toward him were a lot of them were the religious leaders who had their own agendas. So tell us a little bit about the religious leaders and why they were so much against Jesus at this time. What, what did they have to lose? Uh, a, a great deal. Um, <laughs> to be perfectly frank, the, you know, the religious leaders, they, you know, Israel in this, in this time when, when Jesus was uh, walking the earth, Israel, as you just said, was under the oppression of Rome. They were not a, they were not self-governing. They were not sovereign in their own right. So, you know, they were under, it's often phrased as, you know, kind of under Rome's boot heel. Hmm. And, you know, that was something that, you know, they found their, 
they found their existence to be a little bit tenuous at times. There had been a, a number of uprisings in the past, and you know Rome had always kind of crushed the, any uprising of any any rebellion. And so, you know, the Jewish religious leaders at that point they found themselves within Israel. They had a pretty significant uh, deal significant deal of power. They were the they were, you know kind of the, they were the government. They were the religious leaders. They were kind of the culture setters and cultural police, uh, so to speak. So. The religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, and the scribes, and, and so forth, had a, a pretty significant position of power. Um, and what Jesus did when he came, you know, he started to gather a following. And, you know, the story, in, in, as John uh, tells it, you know, it's the fear of that following that prompts the religious leaders to act. So, you know, the, the line of thinking for the religious leaders was look, if he gets a following and Rome gets wind of this, they're going to come in here and they're going to put it down just like it's any other rebellion. They're going to take away our temple. They're going to take away our way of life. And basically Israel, as we know it, will be gone. So they're, they're pushed to this position by Jesus and what he's, what he's saying, what he's doing, the number of people who are following him. They're pushed to this position of having to make a decision of what do we do um, in light of this. And they're, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I, you know, they were working with some, working within a certain set of information, and you know, there's a part, there's a there's a very real part in which they were trying to make a good decision for the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. They were trying to preserve Israel, preserve the temple, preserve the way of life, um, and yet in doing so, they needed to reject Jesus. So their choice was either accept Jesus and follow him, become followers, and risk the wrath of Rome or to reject Jesus, keep our way of life safe, keep our temple, pacify Rome, and you know, therefore get rid of Jesus, um, get rid of his following and, and, and not have to worry about whether or not Rome and the governing authorities are going to see us as potentially trying to break out from under their, their rule. And so you know, there's, this, there's this tension that Jesus pushes the religious leaders to. He puts them in a spot where they have to make a choice about him. And the choice they make is obviously to reject Jesus. And they, you know, the, the story in John is, is very clear that from that point on, they begin to plot how to plot how to kill Jesus. And, you know, the, the high priest's famous statement there that John records is, you know, you don't understand that it's better for one man to die than the whole nation. And, you know, there is the possibility that he's saying that from a genuine concern for the people, not necessarily for his own power, though he had that to lose, mm -hmm. but for their national identity, for their national, um, for their for their national good, for the good of all of Israel, they had to make a choice. They they saw Jesus as a threat to the existence of Israel, which was their task to protect. Their task was was you know to kind of protect and guide Israel through these difficult times until Messiah came. Now, you know, <laughs> the difficulty there is the Messiah was there and then they missed him. Um, and and yet that is what they were doing. They were trying to protect Israel from being, you know, this afterthought for Rome of, and then you know, written off in the pages of history. Um, but they, they were pushed. They had to decide where is our identity? Where is our, where's the importance of our identity? Is it, mm -hmm. is it in our people, in our temple, in our way of life or... Are we willing to sacrifice all of that and follow Jesus? Yeah. And I think Jesus kind of still puts people in that position, to be fair. Is this um, true? You know, the, the idea of Jesus and who we say he is puts us in the position of needing to decide, am I going to be who I am, find my identity in the things that I've always found it in? Or am I going to follow Jesus and find my identity in him? And the things that he says and the things that he does and things, you know, that scripture tells me about who God is and where, where we've been and where we're going. Um, and it's a difficult, it's, to be honest, it's scary. Um, it's a scary decision to make, even, a, even as a one-time decision to say, I'm, I'm going to give up my identity and follow Jesus. Yeah. But like, um, like with other situations, it's not necessarily just a one-time response. Mm -hmm. There are times, there are times in life where we have to choose deliberately, choose to follow Jesus as opposed to what might be an easier experience. Yeah. Find ourselves in a situation where it's just, you know, ah, I, I 
I feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing, but man, that is going to be tough. And it'll be much easier just to keep quiet and follow the crowd or, you know, but mm. sometimes in doing that, we miss identifying with Jesus. He does mention, I think it's in, uh, in Luke, he talks about taking up your cross daily. I mean, it's just a mm. daily decision. And I think we, you know, most of us would recognize that it's not even just daily. It's almost minute by minute sometimes. Uh, sure. you know, wherever you're at, I mean, any response to something that's going on around us, it's like, how do I respond to this as a follower of Jesus Christ? Um, and those two dynamics you're talking about, you've got one, the care for, for Israel, because I mean, they had it pretty good, given what they'd been through in the last couple hundred <laughs> years. <laughs> sure. um, so they was pretty set up nice with Rome and they had a nice relationship. But then you've also got that power dynamic, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I think one thing that history teaches is that people, people who are in power don't like giving it up. Um, they use that power to keep the power. And uh, yeah. as someone said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So um, that that's a reality. And those two things kind of working together, you know, you it's very difficult to separate them to say this, Hell, is, yes. for this reason, as you said, I mean, it's, it's all these things kind of combine. So, yeah. Oh, that's, and I, I don't mean to suggest that their their own position, you know, the religious leader's own position didn't have anything to do with their decision. I'm sure it did. Um, but John does record them as saying, you know, if if Jesus keeps going, then Rome is going to come in and they're going to take away our temple and our way of life. There, there was there was at least that thought of this. This seems to be a danger to, you know, Israel as a whole, not just to our position. And, and I, you know, I. I like to think that there there was some altruism there on their part that they were they were concerned about Israel as a whole, um, and it was their Jesus nation. Does. Yeah, I, so yeah. I'm sure there was I, some was, concern, but uh, you still got but, power. Oh yes, no, so. <laughs> you know, but Jesus does. He, I think that's what he does for everyone. Is at some point, you know, we're we're simply confronted with needing to make a choice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but as as followers of Jesus, you know, as you as you mentioned, you know, it's a, it can be a moment by moment choice. But I think you know, for a lot of people, even there's there's that kind of very very similar experience to this story in Scripture, where it's that one moment where they're confronted with the reality of Jesus and the reality of the cost of following Him, and and they have to choose: Am I going to do what's comfortable, or am I going to follow Jesus? And and you know. We always pray that you know they make the choice to follow Jesus. We know that's the right decision, but it's not always as easy as that. Um, you know, the yeah. religious leaders and, and the religious leaders were divided. We know stories in Scripture of you know some of the religious leaders were Jesus followers, although in secret. You know, so you know, the the perception of Jesus wasn't universal, even among people who made those big decisions about how to treat Jesus as a you know as a potential threat or a potential Messiah. Yeah. We were split. It would be amazing to be able to go back into that time, sit and watch mm. some of those nuances kind of play out. Um, we, we, we read the stories, but we don't have some of the nuance attitudes and other things that kind of go with it. It'd be, it'd be great to, to see that. But one day we'll know the story. One day we'll I know the story. So. so now I know in your book, you give a lot of other responses. There's several that you have. Um, how many responses in total do you give in the book? Is it seven or, or, or seven? I explored seven different stories of, okay. of ways that people respond to Jesus. Yeah. And, and by, by no means is this exhaustive at all. It's just, mm -hmm. I, I looked at seven kind of very popular stories to, to look at how people responded to Jesus in those situations. Yeah. Well, I, I hope that people will make a, make the, the book available to themselves and they can read through those. And even the ones that we've talked about today, these three, um, there's more to it than I, I've read the book and there's a lot more that you can gain from the book itself than we've had time to deal with here. Uh, now, as we kind of run out of time, uh, just wanted to give you a chance, any other thoughts that you have on this topic of pursuing Jesus today that you want to leave us with? Well, yeah, thanks for asking, Dave. I, I think, you know, back to the story that starts this whole book of, of Jesus asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? Um, you know, in the end, uh, he follows that after after they give a summary of the different opinions of Jesus. He follows that with another question, and it's, "But who do you say that I am?" Mm -hmm. So, you know, the the impression there is is that well, Jesus isn't satisfied to know what people out there are saying about him. It's an intensely personal question that he expects his own followers to ask uh, to answer, and I think that question kind of filters down through the centuries to where we are. And Jesus asked that same thing. Who do you say that I am? You know, that's, that's one case where it's overly appropriate 
for us to read scripture in a very personal way and yeah. ask ourselves, well, who, who do I say Jesus is? Yeah. And, you know, my, my dad is, <laughs> is fond of saying, you know, there's a variety of theological opinions on, on, on nearly every subject and he doesn't care about any of them. And, and in the best way possible, he doesn't care because <laughs> his, his question is, who do you say Jesus is and what are you going to do about it? Yeah. And I, I think that's partly what Jesus is asking here. It's, it, it may be wholly what Jesus is asking here. Who do you think I am and how are you going to respond to me? And so, you know, I, I try to follow my dad's lead as much as I can and say, you know, that's really the important question. There are a lot of other important questions too, but that's, this is the question. The really question of all questions. Yeah, it's it foundational. Is. It is because, you know, and, and, you know, you know, the, where we land on other issues kind of springs out <laughs> springs out of this one um you know so th i guess that's all i'd say is you know that it's that it's an important question to ask uh, both in the 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 big basic one-time sense of i'm going to commit to this understanding of jesus but also in a in a moment by moment in a daily sense of how am i responding to jesus based and and what does my response reveal about who i really say jesus is yeah. It's been a, it's kind of a, a landmark element uh, of the Christian faith, mm -hmm. a personal faith. Uh, it doesn't matter what my church believes or my parents or my friends. If I haven't made the decision to follow Christ or to answer that question, who is he? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm just, as Jesus made the statement in John, I believe it was John chapter 13, where he, or 12, he said, either you're for me or you're against me. Mm -hmm. there, there's no, there's no middle way. Um, you can't right. say, I choose not to, not to decide. That's a decision. I'm, I'm going to wait. Yeah. yeah I'm just going to wait until it goes up. Um, nor can you choose all of them. You can't do the foxhole religion and say, hey, I'm going to try every one of them and I'm, maybe I'll get it right. It's like, okay, either that's it's right. me or it's it's not. But uh, yeah, that's right. Well, Jared, right. we thank you for being with us today and uh, answering some questions about this new resource uh, that you've developed. Again, as we've said, there's much more that's in the book and we invite you to be a part of that. Again, you can go to discoveryseries.org. You can order or download a, a PDF, read it online uh, uh, as audio, as uh, JR said, also is available, or you can order printed copies of that and give them out to friends. Uh, I think it's a great evangelistic tool that people may say, hey, I can see myself somewhere in here. Hmm. Also remember that uh, Our Daily Bread uh, Ministry has an online learning site, which is uh, christianuniversitycertificates.org. You get access to over 170 courses, and we would invite you to be a part of that. A uh, very low monthly fee there. Uh, also, there are other resources on the topic of In Pursuit of Jesus at inpursuitofjesus.net. So multiple areas of the ministry have come together to provide some uh, information there. So I would encourage you to take uh, access to that and avail yourself to those resources. So until next time, may, godly, may God richly bless you uh, as you seek to know and to serve him. Goodbye.